that choosing three games by Geller is a very easy task because, and I'm not even showing you my favorite because I already showed it in this class. I showed it actually in another class, not in the legend class, but one of the other classes. But for those of you who are uh, interested in seeing it, it's super recommended. You will not be disappointed. If you have databases or if you can see it online, look for the game Geller Anikaev from the Russian Championship. I believe it was 1979. This is a fantastic game where Geller sacrificed almost the whole set of pieces. I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful game of sacrifices. I wish I could just for, if it wasn't recorded, I would have probably shown it to you again. But I don't want to hear comments online, why are you recycling? So I'm not showing it. You'll see that I'll show you three games from three periods of his life. One is from the early period in the 50s, then something in the 70s and the 80s. So you will see that he can play in different styles. He can play E4, he can play D4. He was a fantastic theoretician. He just really, really knew theory. Really understood that. And at his time, when he was up and rising and playing back in the mid to late 40s and then 50s, 60s, 70s, so many decades, God, there were no computers. And there were no books and magazines like them. He is the one who invented it. And that is what's so fantastic about it. His Sicilian with white or King's Indian with black. Just fantastic stuff that he created. So I chose three of the games. Again, choosing three is like asking who do you love more, mom or dad? You know, it's, it's so many beautiful games that you love there. It's just hard to pick. But maybe you'll enjoy them. This is a game that he played against an opponent that I didn't recognize. His name I didn't recognize. It's irrelevant because anybody who was playing at that time, he was playing decent players. If he's playing a match between Russia and, and England, the guy has to know some chess. So, d4, knight of 6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e4. So we have an Imzo Indian at our hand, and he plays, again, one of the more aggressive lines. Bishop takes, pawn takes, c5. Okay, very well. e3, b6. Both sides playing, uh, playing a very, very logical continuation. Um, white is having a very nice center, but he has very, very funny pawns on the C file. Black wants to take advantage of it. Ideally, his dream setup would be to play bishop a6, knight c6, knight a5. That'll be, of course, what he wants to do. So, bishop d3, bishop b7. Okay, deviating a little bit from our plan. f3, knight c6, knight e2. All this is theory. Castles, e4, knight e8. Well, some of you might say, what the heck is this move? Not only do you allow your opponent to build such a beautiful center, but on top of that you are retreating with his knight, with, with your knight. Well, the reason is very simple. If I'm going to get to play the move bishop to g5, it's bankruptcy. The whole black position can just go down the drain. You cannot allow white to play bishop g5 here. That's just not something you can allow. You don't want to play a move like h6, however, because that later on gives me a chance to push my pawns and that creates a weakness. So therefore, there is a simple retreat. Okay, now, bishop e3. Again, what I really like about this game, and I've said it about other games that I've shown in other classes to my students, what I really like about it is that when you, you're done seeing it, you have the feeling that you could maybe have played a game by yourself. Because so far, I haven't seen one move that you can say, oh my god, I wouldn't... I would never have played that kind of move. The move just makes sense. So, pawn to d6, castles, again white continues in a very, very logical way. Knight a5, knight g3. Needless to say that white has absolutely no interest in working too hard to defend the pawn on uh, c4. He knows that it can go. So now he played the move rook c8, which was definitely a big mistake. Alternatively, he should have played queen d7, and after d5, to try to pacify the bishop on b7, he should have played f5. That would have been a very aggressive approach. Of course, the idea is, if e takes f5, e takes d5. Very, very interesting. Very interesting game. But, like I said, rook c8 was played. And again, Geller in this position starts showing his element. He plays d5. Needless to say that if he allows Pawn takes pawn on d4, followed by knight takes c4, with the rook behind it, then it's going to be a bit much. 
the knight is going to get active, threatening the bishop on e3. If the bishop on e3 moves, maybe knight b2, attacking the queen and the bishop. Uh, that is a little over optimism. You know, this, we cannot allow that. Let's not go crazy. But also, there's no reason why not to play this move. And <clears throat> when you look at the highlighted squares, you already understand how, how this move immediately refutes the idea of rook c8. The rook is now looking very silly. The bishop is pacified, and the knight can't even come back. In the meantime, center kingside is just rich of opportunities. So Geller is taking full advantage of a mistake. So, OK, again, the analysis for some lines. Let's show one line that will demonstrate how already late black is. If queen d7, simply, again, with the idea of f5, simply queen e2. Now everything is under attack. Queen a4, trying to hunt for pawns, f4. Bishop attacking the pawn, and f5. Big attack. Just a humongous attack. This, it's obvious, just by looking at the position, you can already tell that who cares about this pawn? Look at what's happening here. In a second, I'm going to go, first of all, I'm threatening fe. But even if somehow you avoid it, and I get to play f6, this is a total crush. Again, let's divide the board down the middle. Let's say here, for example, between the e and d files. We see one, two, three, four guys vacationing somewhere, and our guys are all piled against this. Imagine if the knight gets to h5, my queen can go to g4. <coughs> Party time on the king side. So, after e5, he tries to close the position. Of course, his, his dream is to somehow maintain things under control, so he could somehow play bishop a6, take the pawn on a4, he wants to have some position where the queen comes here and here, like we saw. Bishop comes here and the pawn goes. So, Geller gives him no chance for that. Immediately breaking at the center. Beautiful. So, yeah, what to do? Again, this is, this is kind of a darn if you do and darn if you don't. In the game, he decided not to take it. Of course, taking, bishop takes, and already e5 is coming. And I don't think black really wants to play a move like f6, does he? Knight f5, doesn't look good. So he tries to contain it by playing rook c7. And Geller immediately goes forward. Already we can see problems. Now, the idea, you can see the arrow is offering the move f6. And I think that this is exactly the threat. I want to play simply f6. If knight takes, bishop g5. And my idea is to play knight h5. And I don't think that black is going to survive that onslaught for very long. Again, very logical play by, by white. f6, a sad necessity. By now, there's nothing else to do. So you might say, wait a minute, yeah, it's a sad necessity, but look how he's defending everything. One rook is defending the f-file, the other one the second rank. What to do now? Watch, take like an image of this position and see how it transforms by Geller. Really nice. Queen e2, connecting the rooks, developing the queen, making sure that c4 doesn't get any accidents. Bishop c8, he realizes that there's just no hope to attack this pawn. h4, again, if this seems mysterious to you, it will not be for a while. You'll see that white is just conducting a one-sided attack. Rook b7. Rook f2, bishop d7, a4. Again, let's give black no dreams about playing the move b5. Just in case he was thinking maybe of playing b5 at some moment, and then like c4. So for example, let's say if I play rook f1, then b5, pawn takes c4, bishop takes, knight takes, and the bishop takes the pawn on b5. This is counterplay that is completely not necessary. One of the things that he was very strong at is restrainment of the opponent. Playing his own game and on the other hand giving his opponent no counter chances. So a4, <coughs> knight c7. Notice how clogged black is. He is really stuck. I mean, it's like all these pieces are interrupting one another. It's like the rook on b7, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can go to b3, but then what's the next move? Just no cooperation among the pieces. And Geller very patiently builds and builds. Doesn't just coffee house, throws a piece or sacrifices. Just plays calmly. 
night here. Some of you might wonder why. The answer is going to come in about one second. Queen e8. <clears throat> now the pawn on a4 is under attack. Bishop c2. Let's not give that pawn until we are ready. It will happen, but let's do it properly. h6. g4. Now we understand the retreat of the knight from g3. He is ready to send his soldiers up the fort. Just to me, this is like a textbook way of attacking. <clears throat> a d4 opening, quiet opening, plays the most aggressive line, builds a strong center, capitalizes on a mistake of rook c8, and now look what happened. King f7, yeah, the king is already taking flight. But White's idea is very, very primitive. He wants to go rook g2, and he wants to play g5 at the proper moment, bring his knight, depending on the necessity, either to g3, h5, or h2, g4, just super. So the king runs, g5. Why not? Has to take, takes, the king keeps running, rook h2, the rook is challenging on h8, again, as expected, nothing new under the sun here. Knight to d2, again, a very smart maneuver. The knight has many possibilities, but watch what he does. The knight protects everything. Rook b8, again, can't blame him for that. Rook takes, queen takes, king g2. Simply he is first on the file because the rook is coming to h1. This is the most economical way to get the file. Now watch what's going to happen with the pawn on g7. Pay attention there. Rook f8, rook h1, and g6. <clears throat> Again, it takes great chess maturity to understand that despite Black's ability to defend g7 plenty of times, this is still going to be enough to win. It looks like, hey, aren't you closing too many files? First the f file, now the g file. Isn't it too much? The answer is no. King d8 moving away from any pins. The knight is reshuffling. Rook e8, again, he's preparing the ultimate defense. Rook h7. Queen f8, knight g3, queen e7, knight h5, rook to g8, bishop h6, knight e8. The ultimate, I'm, def I'm attacking you, defending kind of structure. Beautiful. And you think to yourself, wow, the opponent really deserves kudos for holding the position. Look how he managed to, like a puzzle, put all these pieces in a way that they're defended. Now, you can take on g7, you can take on f6. What is going on? How to increase the pressure? <coughs> so you think to yourself, well, let's find something. And the thing is, black, what's beautiful about this game, you cannot play a move like g6 with white if you haven't foreseen this position and the upcoming continuation. Otherwise, if you play g6, you can just agree to a draw. You must have seen, he must have seen the, the, the coming combination. So first of all, king, again, a move that seems a bit strange. The king just moves to safety. Queen f8. How else to release from all this? And now, bishop d3, protecting the pawn on c4, making sure that everything has to go. He takes the pawn, but already it's too late. I mean, OK. So another variation would have been here. Bishop takes g7, takes, oh, come on, takes, takes, and well, everything wins, actually. You can take on g7 with the rook. You can take on g7 with the knight. Doesn't matter. This is just totally winning. And queen g8 is inevitable. But that's one variation. Just beautiful. So bishop d3, he goes bishop takes a4. Like I've said before in, in some of my lectures, again, it's based on the premise of dying on a full stomach. Might as well take the pawn. Maybe he can do something, because he can't do anything useful. So white plays queen e3. Notice how everything was just like clockwork. Even a little detail like bishop d3, making sure that this pawn was not, not going to take, be taken, only because we don't want this knight to start hopping around and interrupting things. So bishop d1. And now comes the moment of truth, because now the knight on h5 is attack. Does it have to retreat? If it has to retreat, then maybe the whole attack failed. Not with Geller. 
the decisive sacrifice, knight takes g7. A beautiful move to make in this position. I'm just totally impressed. So, well, knight e6 is coming. So he took it. Bishop takes. Again, every time this thing pops, it happens. Bishop takes. And now let's analyze the possibilities. Why didn't he take back? If rook takes g7, queen h6, pinning the rook, the only move to save it is here, and then takes, takes g7. <coughs> Once again, the, the pass pawn is worth more than the extra piece. No way to defend against that. Alternatively, If he plays here, then simply here. Beautiful move. Notice that there's just no move. Nothing to do. I'm attacking f6, I'm attacking e7, I'm attacking a7. My queen can come to h6, just a crush. So he decided to play queen e8. Bishop takes pawn check. Again, kind of amounts to resignation, but what can you do? Here, queen h6, and resigns. No defense against queen h7, and just a crush. A beautiful, beautiful game. Again, Geller was relatively young. Remember, this is 1954, right? 54, yeah. I forget exactly how old he was, but I think the first game that I saw documented on the database was from 46. So again, he's been playing for like eight years, officially or in tournaments. Very impressive. OK. So this is one face of Geller, and now we will see another one. This time he is going to play e4 in a Sicilian. And I remember seeing this game, maybe one of the first games I've ever saw in my life in a Sicilian. I was totally impressed by it. Very, very nice game, very methodical. Again, black didn't play perfectly, but who does when they lose, right? Everybody that loses means they've made mistakes. He is playing Grandmaster um, Karen Gregorian from Armenia, then Armenia, but was still part of the USSR. So e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes, takes, knight f6, knight to c3, a6, we have a Nidorf. And Geller, both for the Nidorf and the, the Schwenningen, he would play the, what seems to be one of the most quiet variations, but what he makes out of them is just fantastic. Bishop e2, e6, so again, the game transposes into a Schwenningen, a Schwenningen. And castles, knight c6. Again, bishop e7 is also possible, queen c7. And sometimes the knight can go to d7, but that's also possible. Bishop e3, bishop e7, f4, castles, queen e1. In the aforementioned game that I've, I've told you about against Anikaev, Geller chose another plan. That was two years later than this game. And he played, or three years later, and he played a4. And again, this is one of the positions where you have to make a decision. Black might want to trade here and at some point play b5. You have to decide, are you going to spend the tempo and play the move a4 to stop b5 once and for all, have to black settle for b6, or are you not going to take the time and just continue with your initiative? He decided to play here, queen e1, knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, b5. Again, a very, very aggressive line in the variation. So Geller plays rook ad1. Nowadays, it's kind of known that the normal line is queen to g3. There's, if you want to see another beautiful game in this variation, um, again, by transposition, you can see the game between uh, Wei Yi and who did he play with black? Very nice, Bruzon, yeah. Yeah, you will not see it here, but again, those of you who are not familiar with it, totally worth it. It's a beautiful king march, you just, and, and the, what's beautiful about that game, so many quiet moves. Like down a lot of material, it looks like how you're going to check, you don't even check. You play this quiet move, the other quiet move, and the king can just not escape a mate net. So this variation is with lots of venom. Anyways, rook d1 was played, bishop to b7, attacking the pawn on e4. You could still go queen g3, because the mate on g7 prevents it, but he decides to play bishop f3. OK, again, remember, this game was played 40 years ago, so yeah. Pawn to b4. 
So up to here, we had a normal Sicilian type of position, both sides building the usual structure. One thing that I have to mention is that when the bishop is on b7 and there's a bishop on f3, almost always this bishop needs some defense. So usually there's a queen on c7. Here, I don't know if the queen on c7 would be the best because of the e5 potential. Maybe he needs to play queen c8 or queen b8. Queen c8, let's say. That would have been probably more interesting. Um, but after b4, still Geller has to prove that he knows what he's doing. Of course, he doesn't need a second invitation. He's not even going to bother moving his knight. <coughs> e5. OK. So first things first, the bishop is now attacking the bishop on b7. So he took it, attacking the rook. OK. Rook takes f3. Everything else stays the same. And he played f takes e5, f takes e5, knight d5. <coughs> Needless to say that if you were to play, I'm, I'm going to try not to move the pieces. Needless to say that if you play pawn takes here, pawn takes here, this is just going to be the end of the world. You're going to lose a pawn and, well, I don't know if you're going to lose a pawn, but your position is going to be really terrible after the capture here. So, takes, takes, knight d5. And again, <coughs> white plays a very logical move here. His knight is being attacked. Should he just trade? It looks like trading is the, the first thing to look at because it's a capture. But I think that this would be a really bad move. If you take, probably I can just take with the queen, mainly because this bishop doesn't have a good discovered attack. And then, of course, my queen can just go back, or I can play bishop c5, and because of that check idea, I'm going to trade my last piece. That's not going to be a good idea. He simply plays knight e4. So you can see that already two sets of minor pieces have been traded. And the position is definitely in white's favor, because black has no counterplay. He is not really attacking anything concrete, as you might see. And white has all kinds of ideas involving this area. You can see that the queen is hungrily looking for it. The rook is already there. The bishop and the knight make sure that everything here is on the up and up from white's point of view. So black played queen c7. Again, a questionable move maybe, but I don't know what to suggest. I mean, white is always going to play the move c3 to just defend his stuff, prevent any, anything from him. So like rook c8 against c3. And again, I think that black is at some of a, somewhat of a dead end. I think in the long run, it's very hard to fix this position. Queen c7, queen f2, OK. The queen is improving his position, keeping this rook honest. The f7 pawn is under fire. Now maybe just rook f1 is threatened. And again, how to answer this? Noted that this bishop doesn't get to go to c5 and trade itself for this one, like he would normally want to do. This knight on d5 is a great knight, but without options of moving. So rook c8, <clears throat> hoping that maybe white will get over aggressive. Like if white plays, let's say, rook to f1 right now, queen takes c2. And even if you take on f7, I will just trade queens. Of course, I will be very, very happy to see the queens off the board if I'm black. Yeah, needless to say that Geller wasn't even thinking in that direction. No chance in heck. Just c3. One little move, solving the problem once and for all. So queen c6. Again, hoping for a chance. Maybe Geller would miss a tactic, but we know that he won't. He wants to play knight takes c3 now. That's the threat. If pawn takes, queen takes e4. If the knight takes, we get to trade knights, something that black finds very desirable. So Geller plays instead knight to the other direction, knight f6 check. Again, this move needs some calculating, <coughs> but I think that not, not really many, right? I mean, I'm sure all of you can see that this is just an obvious sacrifice. It's not even a sacrifice. When you can't take a sacrifice, it's not really a sacrifice. After pawn takes, pawn takes. And if you take again, probably I will take with my rook because I really want to preserve this bishop. If I am left with this dark square bishop with all those Swiss cheese holes on the dark squares, there's not going to be much relief from Black's point of view. So he has to take. I have to say that he cannot just move, obviously. He cannot just move to the corner because then rook h3 or queen h4 didn't solve any problem whatsoever. So he took it, took it, and moved the rook away. 
Again, you didn't want to play g6 because queen h4, queen h6. Queen g3, provoking a weakness. <coughs> g6, and again, here Geller plays very accurately. The beautiful thing is that we know there's nothing much harder than winning a one game, right? That's what the saying, as the saying goes. And here, it's very easy to kind of lose the head, go directly, forge ahead, ignore your opponent, and give him chances. Here he played rook e1. Beautiful. Why? Because in this position, black is already thinking of playing the move e5. Just like in the game, but in the game it was much less effective. If he gets to play the move e5, two things happen. The rook opens up, the line opens up, and the queen's defense by attacking f6 is joining the defense. So you've got to really worry about it. If you play queen to somewhere, e5 could be very, very annoying. So, rook e1. Now we have ideas like queen h4 or queen g5, followed by queen h6, followed by rook h3. Well, I'm sure it doesn't take much explaining to see that black is you know, on the critical list. So he took. Okay, Geller took. Again, notice the maturity. Maybe he can play a queen move, but why even mess with that and allow c2, c1, or something crazy to happen? We don't need that. He takes, and then you don't have to calculate. The element of time is still in white's favor. So, e5. What else? How to stop this maneuver? He tries this. Rook takes, rook takes, queen takes, h6, trying to, is designed to stop queen g5, queen h6, which comes very, very fast. But already we can see that even if somehow there's no mate, all endings are bad. Because A, you're down a pawn, B, this pawn and this bishop are just killing you. This knight is just no match for them. So the rest is for history here, queen g3. Queen h4, threatening h7, h6. He pushed it. Of course, if king h7, we simply go, it's going to be transposition, rook h3. So he pushed, queen g5, idea queen h6. Just a beautiful, everything just falls into place. King g8 and takes. So now he tries the last trick, but of course, Geller was ready for it. After knight takes. Rook h4. Beautiful. Why are you wondering what's going on? Why did he not take? Well, you better not take. Because if you take with the queen, then he goes. I think it's... No, he trades and he goes pawn takes rook, obviously. Because the rook is hanging. I forgot about that for a second. If bishop takes, then you're going to go queen b6 check, queen b1 check, and queen e1. It's white is getting mated. That could have been a real rude shock. <clears throat> but what does he do? He just swings the rook back as if saying, okay, so you took my pawn, now my bishop is open. How bad can that be for me? The knight, of course, cannot move because of rook h8 mate, and I'm just threatening to take it. I'm also threatening at some point, at some right point, might even threatening rook h8 check, but I don't think I have to even bother with that. I just want my knight for free. So, <clears throat> he did this. I think that if he goes rook e6, then queen h6. Just seals the deal. So he tries this last resort here, here. Rook e6, queen h6, check. And after this, check. But after king here, king here. No more checks. No, this, this was not really played. But here he just resigned. Again, a masterful game by Geller. Like you could see, in one game he plays d4, positionally, closes the center, then moves to the king side, attacks the king one way. Here you could see that from the beginning, again, center, king side, and looks like almost like an easy task. When you think black was a grandmaster, you're like, wow. Save for two moves that maybe were very accurate, everything else was kind of self-explanatory. Our last demonstration of this strong grandmaster comes from uh, the 1982 zonal tournament, and he's playing. Then, I think he was. The, was he a champion? I think he was either a champion of the year before. He was Russian champion, Lev Psakis. Now he lives in Israel. A strong coach and grandmaster, very strong. And watch this game. This is one of Geller's all-time best. This is a fantastic performance. I mean, the first two were impressive. This is just out of this world. This is the kind of game that is not so easy to say. Oh, I could have done that. 
because it's not that easy to have done that. So d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e7. Again, we have a variation from the queen's gambit declined. Knight f3, knight f6, bishop g5, h6, bishop h4, castles, e3, b6. So we have a typical Tartakover variation of the, yes? Yes. So we have a, a typical variation of the Tartakover defense with b6, and there are seven million ways to play here. Practically every move has been played, bishop e2, bishop d3, queen c2, queen b3, rook c1, and the variation that was played here, bishop takes, bishop takes, pawn takes, pawn takes, queen d2. Okay, b4 is also one of the main lines, trying to design to make c5 a little more difficult. And just to say two or three words about this variation, you can see that white gave up a pair of bishops, and his idea is saying, okay, the bishop of f6 is not a good bishop. He is stuck behind the chain of pawns. That happens in many lines of the queen's gambit. And he just believes that this is going to lead to a closed position where the knights are going to be better than that bishop. That bishop cannot be revived. Well, watch what happened in this game. Queen d2. So the idea is now that if the bishop goes to b7, then rook d1, with the idea of making c5 very, very hard to make. Black is dying to play c5 so that his bishop will be alive again. But now the rook, the queen, that's why the queen went to d2. He took the time. He's delaying his development on the king side just to stop c5. But again, that comes with a price when black has the right setup. So here he plays, after queen d2, he plays bishop to e6. A much better square for the bishop, much better diagonal. On b7, he's just looking, and here it's just developed very, very wisely. So now, Sach is played, in my opinion, very optimistically. Okay, rook d1, and queen e7, g3. That to me is too much. I think that for better or for worse, he should have just developed his bishop, castle quickly. Yeah, black would have gotten the move c5 very, very speedingly, and equalized. But I still think that maybe black would be a tiny bit better, but not enough, I don't think it will be what happened in this game. This is just taking way too much time when black is already castled and you're going to have to take two more moves to develop your bishop and castle and in the right of a strong player, watch what he does. Step one, c5. He is not preparing it, he is not getting ready for it, he is just playing this move right away and he's telling his opponent, okay, I challenge you to do the worst. Just go for it. Take my stuff. So he takes his stuff, but that's a very, very bad idea. Of course, the correct continuation here is just to concede, just to go bishop g2, knight c6, castles, and black will take here and isolate white's pawn, just like his. He is going to end up with two bishops that are definitely a little more agile than, the, than this, um, just one bishop and the knights. So black is to be preferred. But again, compared to the game, this is heaven. So watch what happened. He took on c5. Now, I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he was naively thinking that black has no good continuation because after b takes c5, maybe knight d5, I, I, I can't tell. But Psakis play, I mean, but Geller played, bam, rook d8. What a move in this position. My guess is that Psakis either didn't see it or really underestimated the variation. This is a fantastic move. He took a pawn and he just defends the second pawn. And again, look at the difference between the kings and the development. That is the main deciding factor of our game. Already white is in trouble. So, he decided to keep taking. Very optimistic. He could have minimized the damage with bishop here. Pawn takes. Now listen, we can tell already that white has a worse position. Now those hanging pawns are easily advancing and I have two bishops to boot. Everybody wants to be black, but white is going to get to castle, he's not going to die. He's not going to just outright die, you know, castling. When you do this, at least your king is safe. So he'll have some defending to do, but maybe he can survive. Instead, he plays pawn takes here. d4. Again, either underestimated or missed. 
Maybe he thought that he would have to take. I don't know what he was thinking. But watch with what force now Geller plays this. He already sacked two pawns on the queen side, and it's like almost like a bug house game. Take them, whatever, I'm just going to have more pieces. A beautiful pawn sack. Now you really have to be careful, because you can see that there's a discovered attack on the file. On the other hand, the knight is being attacked, the pawn on e3 is being attacked. This is no pleasure. So he played bishop to g2. Now, let's examine some of the variations as, as they're analyzed. If you take, I just take it. And after here, here, discover check, and the rook on h1 goes bye-bye. That is very easy. E takes, e takes d4, bishop d5 is the same thing. If knight e2, then queen b7, look at the beautiful resource. Bishop here, takes, attacking the queen, takes, and here, well, for the cost of one measly pawn, I'm attacking the pawn on a2 twice, I can win it at leisure. The king on d1 is going to take him 10 years to try to revive itself to safety. And my bishops and my queen, of course, this is just a completely winning position for black. Alternatively, again, he could have done knight e4, bishop d5, the, line, the knights are skewered, and if you take, queen takes. Queen takes d4, queen takes f3. Watch this again. This is another beautiful thing. After b7, he looks like he's winning a rook. And after this, oh, come on. Okay, there are a million lines, but I can tell you that this is just winning. Totally winning. Beautiful position. The idea here, of course, after king takes rook, bishop f3, you take on b7. So he tries to protect the pawn on f3, so that he can try to queen his pawn. However, I have to eat this, and you have to let go. And black ends up a piece up. Just fantastic analysis. I mean, if we had 10 hours, probably could do <coughs> many hours of analysis here. In any event, so we saw this and this. And he did bishop g2. So knight c6. Again, notice that it's not so easy to play a move like d takes c3, because maybe takes, 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 and then b7. That could be really embarrassing from black's point of view. You have to pay attention to this threat. <coughs> so knight c6, developing the piece. Now b7 is nothing anymore. Now he took on e on d4. Alternatively, if knight e4, d takes e3, queen takes, again rook d1. <coughs> a self-explanatory position. Who wants to be white in this position? It's obvious that there's just no hope. If any of you had this position against Magnus Carlsen and you didn't win, you should be going home crying. <laughs> just totally winning. So in the game, he took on d4. And again, basically, Psakis is putting the burden of proof on Geller. He's saying, OK, I'm going to keep taking pawns, and let's see how far we can take it. So takes, obviously. If takes on a8, then takes here, bishop d4 check, and bishop takes h on. You lose the rook on the diagonal. So he decided to take here. And again, when you look at the position, black is up two, I mean white is up two, four, six, seven, three pawns already, but his king is stuck in the center. But how to win? Geller does it in the best way. Bishop h3 check. You can't afford to lose your bishop, so king f1. Queen. Oh, sorry, first of all, rook takes d4. Forgot about this. Queen to e3. They suggested that he should have sacrificed. Sacrificed the, the queen for the rook, but again, it would be a lost position anyways. Instead, he plays queen e3. And... Again, it looks like now the bishop is under attack, the queens are threatened to be threatened to be traded, the rook is attacking the rook, but Geller just keeps everything under control. Queen b7, what a beautiful little move. Just fantastic. Moves the queen away, save his bishop indirectly. Now, 
Here are the alternatives. In the game, he played f3. After rook g1, the only other move to try to stop the disaster on g7, he simply takes, takes rook d8. When the knight moves back, takes, 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 and check. Watch the difference between the two positions. <coughs> one has a safe king, an active queen, and a super active rook. The other one has the rook basically on the worst spot on the board, and a queen that's just not enough to defend. The queen on e3 is a decent piece, but cannot defend. So, beautiful, beautiful lines. Later on in the video, you can, do, you can take more time, and those at home can just take more time to analyze this properly. So queen b7, f3. Okay, rook takes d1. If the rook has to be traded, let's do it with a tempo and send the knight to a worse square. Knight takes d1. Queen a6 check. King g1. Rook d8. <coughs> Notice that there's just no relief. It doesn't give him one moment's rest. Every move is a threat. Every move is a disaster. Knight f2. Bishop d4. Again, if he was hoping to get relief, now queen e1. And in positions like this, we know that the ending is very, very soon. And he took on f2. Let's examine the possibilities. Here he resigned. Because if queen takes f2, then here. That is self-explanatory. Whether you block with the queen or the bishop, you lose everything you own. Alternatively, after the check, oops. Alternatively, after the check, if he takes with the king, check, come on, check, and again, let's examine the lines, king f1, comes a beautiful move, bishop to c8, the bishop is coming to a6, what a masterpiece, the bishop is just all over, started here, went here, now here, yeah, and after here, check, 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 and mate. Beautiful, again, so another possibility is to block queen e3, but then of course comes the move that separates the queen and the, and the king. Just a phenomenal two to force by, by Geller. Not every day do you see a game where you just sacrifice one pawn, he takes, you don't even bother to take back, you defend it, you just bring the rook to defend the other pawn. He takes another pawn, you advance that deep pawn, and again, the price of leaving the king in the center, even to an experienced Russian champion like Psakis, was just too much. Okay, guys, any questions about this game? Really a shocking game. I really recommend for you to guys see it either on the database or in the video slowly when you have time. You can check it with a computer. The computer is going to show you even more lines behind the scenes, but I think it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm.